All right, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the TestIO uh, Quality Virtuoso Masterclass Series. My name is Tariq King. And um, you know, this week we have a special honor of hosting uh, Lisette Zunin uh, to speak on confidence from quality. Uh, this is actually the second time for the week that I've been on a virtual training with Lisette. Um, but now the roles are switched, I get to host her. Uh, she's been hosting a training on QA and testing for Africa Agility which is uh, free for African girls between 18 and 25. And uh, she invited me to be a guest speaker. And I think, you know, it speaks volumes um, when you have someone like herself, who is uh, not just a role model for these girls, but she's also creating opportunities uh, for them to grow and to be exposed to trainings like this. So, um, you know, before I get into the formal introductions, I just wanted to say thank you, Lisette, for all that you do for the community. And, um, you know, it's, it's very fitting, especially when we look at we're rounding up Black History Month and then moving into Women's History Month. So, um, but yes, uh, Lisette, uh, just to go through a little bit of her bio to introduce her. She's currently the Director of Quality Engineering at Fort Robotics, uh, where she supports the QA program uh, for their cloud applications, embedded software and hardware device teams. Uh, she's focusing there on creating alignment and consistency uh, in the process with the various teams to drive transparency, visibility, accuracy and so on. Uh, she has over 18 years of practical experience when it comes to uh, helping companies improve their quality processes. And uh, I've known her as an international speaker at different agile uh, software quality and testing conferences. Um, and I know she's very passionate about quality engineering, leadership, women in, women in STEM, et cetera. So uh, welcome, Lisette, and I'll uh, switch it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And uh... Uh, I'm excited to see you again. Uh, thank you for the invitation from uh, Testio and EPAM groups. Uh, I'm excited to be here to really talk about, you know, quality, confidence from a quality perspective. But also, at the very start of um, Women History Month, as you mentioned, and welcome to Confidence from Quality. Thank you to Tessayo, uh, EPAM Group, and also Tariq for hosting this. Um, my passion is really into quality. I've been in quality for all my adult life that I like to tell people. Uh, I don't look like it. A little bit about me. I think uh, the introduction that Tariq gave uh, really cover, you know, some of my passion really on women in tech, women leadership, and uh, solve equality challenge for company. Um, I have the opportunity to work uh, in various organizations uh, with teams that are global, geographically diverse, uh, located. I've worked at uh, Apple, Nortel, Yahoo, all tech company, but also at a non-profit organization a couple of years ago where I was leading really uh, the digital uh, quality insurance uh, uh, organization, which was one of the first for the organization to actually have that department. And um, as a consultant myself, I've worked with a lot of startup. I really enjoy working with startup because uh, things are scrappy, things are brand new, and uh, you get to build uh, the organization from the ground up. I currently work at uh, Fort Robotic, and I'm excited to be solving a quality challenge over there in security and safety for machines of today and uh, machines of the future in the robotic space. So let's get started. Really, for today's session, we're going to cover five big area and I'll run through them really quickly, but I want to make sure that you know we have plenty of questions at the end. I will definitely encourage you to put a question in the chat as we go so that you know we can spend some time and answer each question because I feel like sometimes that's where the buckle of the conversation happen, right? Um, confidence, we're going to talk about confidence journey in the LCLC process. We're going to talk about using KPI to drive confidence. The best view, who has the best view of the uh, SDLC process? How do we create a world-class customer experience from a quality perspective for our customer? And how do we create a first-class product for, for, for our client and for our customer as well? Then we wrap up. Now, this whole journey into confidence really started about uh, uh, almost more than a decade ago, 2010 to 2014, I was working at Yahoo, and I, that was really actually my first time leading uh, a QA team. And I was fortunate to lead a QA team that was uh, 
geographically uh, diverse, me sitting in Dallas, working the development team uh, in California, where we had a white box testing team. And then in um, uh, New Zealand, Australia, where we had an integration testing team. And then in uh, Bangalore, India, where we had our um, uh, regression teams as well. So I found myself, I used to have this uh, um, engineering manager that I was not reporting to, but uh, uh, he probably doesn't know that he impacted me that much. But he used to come to my cubicle back in the days when we were in cubicle and ask me like, okay, how's the testing going, Lisa? You know, how are we doing? I usually give the normal answer like, you're doing great. You know, we have about maybe 30% left to do. You know, this team is doing this, this team is doing that. But he always kept coming back, you know, and it was a little bit irritating for me at some point. How confident are you, you know? What is your confidence level? And I'm like, and I was just giving the typical, you know, <laughs> key way answer. Well, I look at the dashboard, we have 80% test space. Pass, you know, I give him, throw metrics at him. We have X, Y, and Z test failing. But he kept coming back and asking me, what is your confidence level? And instead of me taking it really in a negative way, I start wondering like, okay, I think I'm having a micro view of uh, my testing. I should have a, a, a really, you know, macro view of like, what is the confidence level? Because with all this team everywhere, you know, how confident, uh, how confident are them about what they actually deliver to me? So I changed that question and I was able to now, from that moment, you know, everybody that worked with me know this is one of my favorite things that I love to ask people when I'm working with my team, QA developer and area team, like, what is your confidence level, you know, with this thing that you're delivering? Because I want people to not only understand from themselves, you know, because if you're confident in the work that you're delivering, you know, then we're going to have a collective better confidence in the, what we're delivering for our customer. So that's where the journey really started for me into understanding, you know, how confidence is weaving into everything that we do in our delivery. So today we're going to really cover it from this perspective, right? Technology and also business. Confidence is really at the heart of what we are delivering from the product owner, the developer, the quality insurance, DevOps, engineer, customer support, product marketing, sales, and all the way to our customer. How do we provide confidence in our delivery at each of, with each of these folks at each of these steps? Now, let's take a look into our delivery process a little bit. And being a QA uh, leader, you know, I'm always often asked to talk about what is the strategy, right? And so the trilogy of strategy, of QA strategy that I look into is really the people, the process, and technology. So I'm always curious because the people, you saw my previous slide, at least role, right? So the people are really at the heart of what we are doing individual who are involved with the testing process and all the part, part of the delivery are really critical to you know how we the strategy that we provide and who understand our goal and uh, how we collaborate together we have to have confidence in the people you know in the talent the skill that they they bring in so that they really know what they're doing when i look at processes you know it's really for me about simple process a well defined process you know because when there's a lot of ambiguity in an organization where we don't know what we're doing at any given time that's where we have low confidence is what we're delivering so having an established process process is also critical to that and obviously technology is is what everybody expect us to 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 have but for me i feel like technology should enable us into the process that we have and really empower people to do their job you know let it be using automated tests hardware and software the pipeline that we build and we talk about all this but to start i'm sure you guys heard this but i love these three amigos you know uh, i'm a french native speaker so amigos is like ami and what that mean really is these three folks in the organization they have to be bodies right so it's really the B ba in organization or the product owner but whoever is responsible of the business requirement and defining the acceptance criteria. They need to work hand in hand with the developer who is responsible of implementing, ensuring that uh, the requirement is met. And then QA is the third person in this Amigos, uh, uh, three Amigos is really to continuously make sure that uh, we verify the functionality that meet the criteria, identify and then show, uh, 
uh, share the bugs. So these three folks need to really continuously meet. They need to review each other's work at any given time. And we need to have confidence in what the developer provide us, right? We need to have confidence into actually the requirement that we're working on. Does it provide business value? And I always love to make sure that everybody's aware of the QA processes because uh, I have a funny story to share. I was at a conference in uh, Dhaka, Senegal last year. And when I finished my, my talk, I, as I always love to hang out with people because that's where you actually learn what's happening. And one of the leader came to me and he was telling me, oh my God, the way you explained QA was totally different than what I ever thought because my team, the Q organization in my team is at the eighth floor and we never go over there because I, I don't even know what they do. I don't understand the process. It's always really, uh, it's almost like a dark place, you know, because it, it sounds like that's where everything goes to just too much bureaucracy. And I was like, that's exactly what we don't want. You know, I, I actually pitched to them and like, send me to them, you know, I'll go have a, a, a chat to them and get them out of, off of that island. Because we want to make sure that everybody understands the QA process, right? Requirement, a lot, whatever you define, but this is what I usually define for teams that I work with uh, in, in the past couple of years that I've been leading Q organization. It's really concretely simple process. We're planning, we're designing, we got to execute our test, defect tracking and regression. And we keep doing that for every release. So everybody know what this group of folks supposedly are always working on. I also like to make sure that, you know, we know what are the paper trail. I work for a robotic company. We have a lot of compliance. We have a lot of certification that we got to meet. So our deliverable need to be clear to everybody. You know, what are the paperwork that we're doing? We could be doing a great, great job, but do we have a test plan? You know, what is our test report? What is our defect report? There need to be visibility and transparency into all those. You know, do we have a traceability report from a requirement to test case execution all the way to, to report? And do we have a strong release note? What are the metrics that we're using to really define our, uh, our quality and ending and showing that test coverage is happening? So the QA deliverable also do provide some confidence because a lot of people that are not in QA, they need to understand, you know, what should I expect from quality, right? How is that giving me confidence in the, in the product that's been delivered? And once you show kind of like open what we do to people, it makes sense. And that alone can start giving them confidence. Also, uh, QA automation is something that is uh, at the heart of the work that we do as QA leader. So it's also important that the, your team, your organization members understand what is the strategy that you're using. It's not a black box kind of thing. How do we define our strategy, you know? And it changed based on the product or the, the service that you are providing. But these, these are like the golden things that I always look for, you know? Let's do a baseline of our test today and have understanding of what do we have today. Prioritize our tests. Select an automation framework. That's always a, a topic that everybody is interested in. How do I select? What tool do I select? So what is the process that you go to select the tool? People need to understand that because that's a question that why are we using Playwright today and not Selenium anymore? The team need to understand that, you know, and also all the library that we create part of our framework the process that we go through, they need to see that. How are we integrating our tests and our development processes? We can show visibility in that as well. And the last piece is really what I think people don't know a lot is we got to review our code for our tests. We got to maintain our test group because this is really um, testing, automation testing is actually pure code that we're writing. And people need to know that. And that we also need to spend some time maintaining those scripts as well. And at the same time, we have to move from this old approach of this ice cream cone, cream ice cream cone anti-pattern where we have little unit tests and then with the rest is a bunch of tests that we have to do and we spend a lot of time in the exploration, but exploring a manual test. But the foundation is where the team need to invest into unit tests, right? At every code drop, we need to know that we are testing every uh, pull request every uh every every co every part of the code you know every class that we have has some unit tests you know funny story when i started my career in uh engineering you know my first job out of graduate school i was writing a unit test you know for 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 six to nine months was it fun 
it was an experience, but I really learned a lot about, you know, coding and how people code and how people, you know, don't even code well sometimes. And, and for lack of better word, didn't have any unit tests. That's why they, they brought in a fresh new grad to just write unit tests for like a team of like seven engineers that just had a code for years with no unit tests. So I have a very <laughs> special uh, uh, love story with unit tests in, in a good way, right? Because I feel like the foundation of where we should invest the time. And then then also that also get confidence because that's where there's there's a correlation about the lack of unit tests and the, the quality of the product that you deliver, you know, and also the ability of developer giving code that does have unit tests to other QA folks and them realizing that the, the, the code is buggy, you know, it has a psychological effect that I don't even want to get into here. But the, the idea is to invest in unit testing as a foundation of your automated test and focusing on the tests that give you the highest ROI. I think that's where the, the you're going to get most of the value from. Continuous testing is something that I'm passionate about these days because I do believe, you know, the ability that we have now with all the modern um, uh, infrastructure that we, 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 we have to develop infrastructure, to be able to build the code and continuously test at every level. That even all the way through we monitor, even in production, the ability that we have to test, that's really going to strengthen not only our DevOps culture for most organizations, but also provide confidence to us. You know, I know that, you know, at every environment that I have, I have better confidence because we probably have some quality gate that is really allowing us to determine how well our code is. And if our code is good, then we know that we're going to have a good product at the end. So let's take a look into a DevOps KPI, how KPI is also going to provide some confidence for us, right? And there's a lot of metrics out there. I'm a, I'm a geek about metrics, you know, how much metrics can we show to really show how good is our product, right? So this, this slide is really showing the different metrics that are out there, time of frequency, um, let me see, automated test case, defect, change failure rate, but I want to go to this slide and show you that these are, these has become, you know, my four key metrics that I'm really focusing on these days in terms of like DevOps. And the reason why I love these metrics is they are not focusing on a specific team, you know, to be able to get the lead time, the change failure rate, the deployment frequency and the time to restore. These metrics are coming from Dora metrics, which is like a researcher from a, a Google lab and also driven from this book called Accelerate that I, I, I love to learn and uh, read about lately a lot. You know, it's really the ability that this metrics does not focus on a specific team. You really bring up a collaboration among all the, the team member in the, in the developmental cycle to be able to get this metrics and really have a data-driven decision-making to determine the quality of your product. That's really key here. Now, let's take a look at uh, uh, how the business process, uh, you know, can provide, how can we provide quality in our business processes from a best view approach, from a first class approach, and also from a world class perspective. Now, uh, a little bit about my family, you know, this picture show a lot about, you know, you see my Cuban here. I'll tell you a little story. I've been uh, married for about uh, uh, 13 years. And uh, for 10 years in my uh, marriage, my husband showing the picture here, he's a huge ba basketball fan. We are a huge uh, sports fan, basketball and soccer. But every time he used to go to the game, he always get a specific seat in the game. And I never really care about the seat, but I knew that it was super expensive because every time I would look in the bill, I was like, what, what are you doing, you know? But uh, a couple of years ago, I believe in 2019, because I was pregnant about my, with my son in this picture, so he's not in the picture. But my daughter was in a dance, uh, was part of the math dance group. So we had to go to the stadium because I have not been to the stadium in, in a while, you know, since I had kids. I always let them go to the stadium with the dad. So I got to experience, you know, the, the seat actually, you know. And uh, down here, as I'm showing, you know, I was sitting, my husband got a, the regular seat, season seat that he had, but he got some extra seat for us. And then I realized that, you know, he had a point. 
this seat was really the best view in the whole house, you know. In this seat, you can see, and it was right behind Mark Cuban, you know. And in this seat, you get to see who is dunking, who is missing the dunk, all the, you know, crazy moves, all the facial expression that uh, Mark Cuban usually have during the game. He's a uh, owner slash coach slash fan slash super passionate. And as I was sitting there just on the realizing why my husband spent so much money in this seat, I was like, this is the best seat in the whole house. And as a QA person, I was like, we have uh, the best seat as part of the quality, the, the, the deliverable, you know, software deliverable. QA really changed agent, right? We understand the pain point in the software delivery. We also deliver value and we sometimes innovate because we are SMEs over the product at at some point we are leader with our title because we have to influence people without authority we don't people don't report to us but we got to influence them in a way where they make change to the product you know impact the quality of the product and we do bring a lot of transparency and visibility into the work just like i've shown a lot so we have the best view in the software deliverable now, a world-class experience. Let's talk about customer service, right? How we have we can provide the quality for customer service. As I mentioned, we are soccer fan, so I had the privilege to attend this year or last year, 2022 World Cup game in Qatar. So, and for me, that was one of the highlights of 2022 and probably for a long time because uh, this was my first time attending a, a World Cup event. And from the moment I arrived at the airport, you know, it was like a 10 minute experience. And that this picture here where I'm standing was critical picture that my husband took as a surprise because the customer experience, the number of security that we have to go through and me being in security, it was also important because our ticket was set up in a way where the ticket does not activate it until you are very close actually at this specific location next door is the stadium that's when your ticket actually get activated so the whole time we were in the cities with free bus and all the amazing experience your ticket is not available and the customer service experience that we got were world class this uh, event, finally we got to the, the game where I was watching a match between Ghana, one of the last West African country, and Uruguay. And um, at this game, we realized that and at the end of the World Cup, everybody voted this as one of the best uh, uh, customer service experience of World Cup uh, experience. And uh, my husband being somebody that have been to a few World Cup before this also testified that it was a 10 of 10 of 10. So I'm talking about this example because I want us to look at how we can provide a world-class uh, customer experience to, 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 to our product and to our customer, right? And how do we provide confidence in our customer support cycle? It's super important that, you know, after you deliver your product, you also take some time to take care of uh, your customer supporting because they really are the ones that are closely working with the customer. So it's really about providing an ease of use. So we got to go back and when we are creating the software, provide uh, an ease to use intuitive for the customer support to feel confident in their ability to assist the customer with any question or issue that might happen. When the customer can easily navigate the software, it can help reduce the number of support. It's also about stability. You know, a key aspect of quality software development that contribute to customer support team confidence is really how stable is uh, is the product that you're delivering. You know, the ability to troubleshoot and resolve issue in case that may arise is also important. And my favorite is documentation because documentation these days have not uh, have a good uh, reputation, right? People are moving a lot away from documentation. Whereas having a comprehensive documentation explain how to use and allow customer support to be able to 
easily troubleshoot, you know, and they feel confident. You give them confidence. And I've actually spent a lot of time this day working with customer support uh, success team through my team to give them a lot of documentation, you know. And obviously, the last one is bug fixes and updates. How often are we able to get that feedback? And I always love to talk about 360 feedback. You know, whatever we're learning from customer support team, if that's a bug or even if it's an improvement, how fast are we able to bring that back? in our backlog and uh, work on a also provide confidence to the customer support uh, team as well now uh, how do we build a first class product you know uh, the few times that I had experience or privilege to fly first class you know except you know all the glitz and glamour that people enjoy in first class I love as a foodie love love to look at the menu and really pay attention to what's going to be served because I'm only there really for, for the food part. That's really my favorite part of being in first class. So I'm saying that to say everybody has a different uh, uh, interest when you're building a first class product, right? And to provide confidence, you, I saw this iceberg and I felt like it really indicated what I really wanted to talk about here is uh, how do we provide uh, confidence for, for the sales team, right? These are things that they underneath, they're really drawn in to figure out. They need to work on the product knowledge, have a good understanding of the product knowledge. And as QA folks, we can help them with that. I've actually worked in an organization where the sales team was just next door. So I get to go, you know, show them how the product, understanding how they're using it. A process knowledge. They also, when they understand how the process, the product is built, it also gives them confidence in how they're gonna sell. And usually, we have this back and forth with sell team about you know what they should sell and what they should not sell. It's really for us, you know, engineer to really help them understand you know what is ready and what is gonna be in the roadmap in the future. And competitor knowledge, right? That's really something that they they need to figure out the landscape of the ecosystem of like who are the the competitor in this product space that you are selling and the customer knowledge right as well as the experience and belief but for us you know having a good product knowledge we can really be part of this uh confidence that we can provide to sell team but also what we can do tangibly is really from each iteration right i'm hoping that everybody is using some kind of agile methodology but even if you're not just doing demo to your to your to your stakeholder in your organization provide a huge value but also give them confidence i love love these days you know we get to do that in a in a, a virtually but i love to see customer or people that are going to use our product faced when they're really looking at it because they do give you feedback that you can bring it back to your team and really trying to solve and give them confidence because when they see how it's working good or bad you know they see how we resolve in both they are able to take those demo learning and take it back to customer and be able to strengthen uh, the, the sale pipeline now a couple of the data out there from a marketing perspective right because uh, sales when we talk about sales we're also thinking about our product marketing team how they're also packaging the product to market it you know Higher quality, it's shown here into how consumer top driver of uh, loyalty is impacted. The number one thing, the highest number here is higher quality product, right? So if you have a good quality product, you know, you are going to be able to have a good brand. You know, people will navigate to your brand easier and everything else follow. But I love when I saw this, that this is really uh, bringing it home that how we really need to work on our quality to bring confidence to, you know, our sales team so they can be able to sell this product out there. I'm looking at the time. What is, well, and also as part of your brand, right? When you look at like, what is the brand value? How are you determining the financial worth of your brand? It's really about a couple of these things, the brand awareness, the perceived quality. And there's the key word there is really the perceived quality, right? The brand association, loyalty also matter. But for me, I feel I, like I've, I've always say, the quality of your product directly impact, you know, your 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 brand value and uh, how you you show up and the financial worth of your brand as well. Now, to wrap up, 
I hope I'm still good on time. To wrap up, I tried to speed it up a little bit since uh, we waste some time at the beginning because of technical. Let's look at the Agile Manifesto, you know, because I feel like uh, the Agile Manifesto already give us some guideline on how we can bring uh, confidence into, into, into the product that we're we building uh, uh, through quality, right? Interaction and individual, uh, inter individual interaction uh, against uh, process and tool, right? Working software, prioritizing working software instead of a comprehensive documentation. So the key word there is working software. We've got to make sure that the, the software works. We can get feedback from it. But customer collaboration instead of a long contract negotiation or ever-ending contract negotiation. That also allows us to be able to collaborate. So we got to make sure that our team are working in sync with uh, customers so we collaborate to get that feedback from them but the last one is really the major one how quickly are we able to respond to change and i showed earlier our ability to fix our bug quickly you know provide uh, releases uh, faster through our modern uh, ci pipeline ci and cd pipeline how quickly are we able to go to market is really what's going to bring confidence to our our, our customer through our for our product but think something you can take away today is here are the four ways to gain confidence from quality, right? Transparency is something that I'm passionate about, you know, how development team openly and honestly communicate progress, you know, provide where issues are. Everybody in the organization should know where we are. Transparency is a... All right, sorry about that, folks. Again, technical difficulties. Uh, looks like Lisette was wrapping up, but... um. We'll give her a few minutes to join again. Uh, maybe while we're waiting, Tariq, if you wouldn't mind maybe kind of sharing some of your thoughts on, you know, the, the, the topic of quality, you know, uh, leading to building confidence both internally and externally, and especially maybe within, you know, our current economic climate, you know, the importance of building that level of confidence sort of holistically? Yeah, no, I mean, I was really enjoying um, every part of this because um, number one, like you said, in this economic climate, <laughs> having confidence is something that uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult in uncertain times. Um, but, and then the very nature of testing sometimes and quality assurance, I don't like to use that term, but that term is used widespread for the very fact that you can't actually uh, make guarantees, right? Uh, you always know that you're going to ship the software. There's going to be bugs. Um, but at the same time, uh, I like Lisette's uh, approach to it in saying, let's take that question that's normally a negative thing and turn it into something that can help to drive. Um, I guess my daughter just got home. So that I can get to drive um um you know our our craft to be able to provide value that says hey look it seems like we're good to go and how can we get there it's, i really see it as a, a call and a challenge um so yeah it looks like lisa is coming back in let's see if we can get her the internet is not my friend today <laughs> that's super unfortunate but thank you you got my back <laughs> yeah, yeah, always. No, I, I, I was, I was just saying, like it, it's really interesting. Um, I'll just repeat uh, real quickly for what you, you missed there. I was just saying, kind of, it's, it's usually a hard thing for us as testers to put a stamp of approval on something because we know the nature of software is such that there's going to be bugs, there's going to be issues, but then at the same time, the value proposition that we bring to the table, especially being holistic and you know, I have a question for you on the on the seat at the table stuff. Um, is that um, you know we want to remove risk. We want to find the biggest issues before we go, and we should be confident enough to say yes, we can go. Um, uh, given that we've you know done uh, our due diligence, not to make sure that there's no bugs, but to make sure that you know the risk has been mitigated. Yes. I think we, it's time for question. If if that was the question, I'm happy to chime in. But 
I, I love that you mentioned that, you know, it's about risk. And uh, I'm not a fan of organization or when I see in a job description when they say zero defect. For me, it's a delusion, you know, because uh, at any given time, <coughs> it's all about what you know, right? How about the unknown that we don't know? So based on what we know, that's why I always value transparency, because if we're transparent on what we know today, then if something else are, uh, arrive, especially when we miss requirement, that's where really most of the issue happen, right? When we miss requirement, then we acknowledge that there's a miss of requirement. And me being somebody that's really strong into process development, I like the team to automatically understand how we can fix that in our process so that it doesn't happen again. That's really usually my posture for those kind of things. But for me, it's like, let's make sure everybody know how we work, you know, because I, I don't know if uh, that part transpired in my presentation about the story of like what these people are doing on the eighth floor. That was kind of like a, a dark side uh, uh, way of seeing how a uh, key way folks work. But I want people to have transparency in our work. And yeah, we give a, a stamp of approval for what we know today and it can change. But at least we are confident in the work that we, we provide into the, the, the team. Yeah, very well said. And so, yeah, I, I do think, uh, folks, if you have questions, please post them in the chat. Uh, I'll I'll be uh, selfish and ask my question uh, right away. Um, so, Lisa, like I, I found your analogy of the seat. I mean, and your husband is a very wise man to get such good seats at the games. Um, but I loved your analogy of the seat and 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 you know saying that QA have a great seat at the at the table there. Um, uh, but we have to get to the table, right? So I guess one of the things that I've seen um, where organizations uh, have tend to struggle is that they typically don't have the right folks at the table. So before you can get a seat, I guess you have to get into the building. Um, any advice on, you know, how to, you know, break into the organization, especially those parts that might be siloed and might be difficult for you to actually get access to? Yeah, that's an empirical question. You know, when you say the word silo, this is what I always uh, push my team, right? Because when I'm talking to somebody and they're like, I don't know what they do, I'm like, go figure it out. You know, I don't want to hear because I've worked in an organization of like 10,000 people and uh, my ability to go reach out to folks for what I need is is uh, was was never been blocked. So I think we have to take do our own homework, right? When we have that seat, whatever that seat is, we have to empower ourselves to be able to go and make sure that, you know, once you have that role and you are the QA or whatever role you have in the organization, take that seat and bring all the value that you can bring into that role so that people see the value that you bring in in that role. And that way, you know, as we talk community and we talk, you know, the future, that the role that you have in the organization, we allow them to see the value that you bring. And perhaps in the future, there'll be more people that they'll bring at that seat. So that's my approach usually, but don't be afraid, you know, be curious, reach out to people and uh, it, it never hurt. Great advice. Uh, we do have a question from Julia. Uh, she says, thank you for a great presentation, Lisa. Um, can you tell us about your perspective on crowd testing as a builder of confidence for QA teams? For example, can you expand on how crowd testing companies like Tesla can be viewed as a confidence builder? So I guess it's leveraging the power of the crowd and your thoughts on that. Yeah, that that's 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 a great question because for me, what what that can easily provide us the, the crowd testing ability and having company like Tesla giving you, you know, a tester to be able to test your stuff is really two things, right? You have a outside independent view. So somebody that is non your organization day to day and understanding all the political and bureaucracy that comes with uh, the product, but they have an outside perspective into your testing. But also I love to talk about this, the diversity, right? The diversity of thought and diversity of skill and diversity of testing also. These are uh, crowd testing provide you, you know, a great diversity into folks that are going to test because I advocate uh, always that folks that are testing should look like the people that should be using the product, you know, so crowd testing really bring you that ability in a very well packaged way, 
right? Because God knows how many people you have in your organization that can test for you. But if you can leverage, you know, crowd testing, that will give you that diversity and you strengthening really your testing and also providing confidence to your product and customer that are going to use it because everybody is already having the ability to touch it and test it. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, we always say, I always tell people that, um, you know, as testers, we try to put on different hats um, and pretend to be users. And uh, I think it was James Whitaker that said it once that, you know, real users don't have to pretend, right? And so by leveraging, um, you know, real users and folks who um, are representative, like you said, and diverse, uh, really can help to build that confidence because usually it works great in the lab and then you push it out there and then you find those those issues. So. Yep. Um, let me see if there's any more questions. A thread here. The chat is typing. All right, so we have here as a director of quality engineering at Fort Robotics, could you share your perspective on QA in relation to the future of robotics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning? Is that a question for me or Terry? I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not the director of quality at, at Fort Robotics, right? Okay. <laughs> so no, I think the, it's for you. The end of the, the question sounds like something for you. But yeah, uh, I have a unique post position in my current role where we are solving the challenge of uh, software challenge, which is something that I've been doing for the past 15 years, and I love doing that. But also the challenge of like... Um, embedded you know embedded and also uh, hardware as well and and in the robotic space because our product enable you know robotic uh, machine in the robotic space to really solve sa safety and security challenge so you can see think of a venn diagram of all this and that's what excites me every day when i wake up because i feel like as i was talking to icto when i interviewed this for this role Quality is really at the heart of everything that we're doing, right? We cannot provide a safety mechanism, you know, and when we're talking about safety, it's really like people that are using this big machine, you know, in the agriculture space or construction, and without stopping the machine, you know, it can, it can kill somebody, you know? If we have a malfunction, it, somebody in a factory can get can can get run over by you know a big machine. So the robot should be able to stop at any given time. So not able to provide quality is the deadly thing in this in this space, right? So it's a little bit challenging, thrilling, and exciting for me to be at the heart of that solution because I want to make sure that the solution and uh, problem that we're solving is really helping our customer. And um, where does QA fit into that? Yes, we fit right in. And I know that I really love to talk about the metaverse and the virtual world. For me, that that is all of this system and solution out there, and even in the robotic space, it's a little bit more physical, right? Because it's not just the metaverse. So, okay, what happened in the metaverse? How do we test that? That's important. But in the robotic space, it's really physical. Those physical machine, you know, that we think it's going to replace a human being, right? We still always have an operator, you know, uh, pulling on the machine in the, in the, uh, as a, in the facility. But in the field, think of a mining field where you have a bunch of construction and you have one or two robots just trying to drive them, right? What, what the future of that is if we make a mistake and we don't have a precise uh, result, somebody might, might might get impacted. And for me, when I go to bed at night, I want to make sure that my team do the due diligence in terms of the testing so that that does not happen. That's where the future is in terms of robotics. So quality is a big piece of it. Yeah, those are those are great points. Um, you know, especially when you start talking about safety uh, critical and mission critical systems. Uh, and I also find it very exciting. I, I also remember, uh, and this might blend into something that you mentioned earlier about how you started your career in white box testing techniques. And I remember um, being fascinated while I was in college, uh, reading a paper that was talking about the Department of Defense and um, how their code coverage criteria, minimum criteria was multiple condition coverage, right? Which is mm. a lot stricter than even branch coverage or you know the industry standard of getting statement coverage. 
uh, and it is because of some of those things talking about being mission critical and safety. You know, you're dealing with um, these physical systems, but you're also dealing with mission critical. So uh, it's actually quite exciting to think about uh, testing in those uh, areas, but also kind of intimidating and maybe a bit scary, actually. More scary than the metaverse, which doesn't really <laughs> exist. <laughs> Right. Yes, that's why I was like, that's a quite interesting because the way the question was framed is like AI, yes, artificial intelligence, machine, but in my area, robotic is really those physical machine. We're thinking about how to stop them so that they don't impact human, you know, and for me, it's a, it's a really a dream job because I'm always wanting to make sure that I do something in terms of quality at the heart of it that is helping uh, folks, that is helping human at the end of the day. So. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, again, bugs, bugs cost. But <laughs> when you think about that, this is the cost of the human life or. Exactly. Or so, uh, that's really uh, something to think about. Um, so I don't see any more questions here. Um, I know we're coming up on the hour. Um, Lizette, I just wanted to say uh, again, um, a lot of, of thanks and kudos to you for all that you continue to do. This is very interesting and very thought provoking. Um, especially um, to kind of see the, the gambit of, you know, everything from, you know, quality gates to the people, the process, the technology and bringing all these things together. Um, I think, um, you know, we definitely took away some nuggets from this in terms of how to um, build confidence, but then also have the courage to articulate it. So just wanted to say <laughs> thank you and, um, you know, continue to do all the good work that you're doing out there in the community. So thanks. Yeah, thank you again to Tessayo, Ipam, and uh, Tariq for hosting me. It was a privilege again to share this uh, passion of mine, my knowledge, and also to learn from you guys because uh, this masterclass continue, right? The first one was with Tariq. I learned a lot. I'm always a student when you're speaking, so uh, I'll continue being uh, involved and learn from all other master series coming up. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, thanks for joining us. Ted, I don't know if you have any final words. Maybe I should put you on the spot, Ted. <laughs> Ted is on mute. Ted was very smart about that. All right, so yeah, with that, we'll wrap up. Uh, thanks again for everyone that joined and um, you know, we'll make sure the recording is available for those who had to step out. So thank you. <laughs>